first of all, just thank you all for being here. And I know that uh, you know an elevator is a huge part of a of a small community, and so important to to our strong communities, to our small communities. I'm just talking to the mayor a little bit about how everybody came together, and they're bringing you know food out from the uh, restaurant, and and it says so much about a community when everybody comes together like that, and the and the mutual aid. So thank you to all of you that. Uh, the first responders that came out and um, helped uh, put that out and make sure that everybody was safe. I, I understand there was no injuries or no deaths, and thank God for that. Um, but uh, but we have to move forward from here, like the mayor said. We got to look forward um, and uh, and uh, you know make sure that we can uh, do what we can to get you guys back, uh, get you back whole. And so I appreciate all of you being here and. And I will say, you know, I talked to the mayor just after and offered our assistance from our office. And I know that the the, the state folks have been out here, the governor has been out, and, and I think that we all want to make sure that you get the kind of assistance that you need and um, and making sure that we can do uh, As the Ag Chair in the State Senate, uh, I know how important agriculture is, and uh, these are the backbones of our communities, and uh, our agriculture sector needs elevators. We need good market opportunities and so anything we can do from the state to be helpful uh, here in Senate District 12 let myself let Representative Backer the Congresswoman Fishbach know uh, what we can do to work together focus on how do we rebuild how do we make sure Clinton and Big Stone County still has a strong elevator and strong agriculture and market opportunities because that's really what these elevators uh, demonstrate this is what how important elevators are. Sometimes we maybe take them for granted, uh, but they are the icons of our rural communities. And so uh, glad to be here. Thank you for all we coming We have to out. do things from a state perspective, and probably federal too, to cut down the, per to speed up the permitting, because as the Duma board knows, um, um, and as Phil shared with me earlier this week, um, years ago it'd take a million dollars to start an elevator. Now six million dollars barely does it. So, um, I shared with the governor and the commissioner, we have to look at ways to streamlining the permit process and not use regulations to put a thumb on this type of growth. That's if the board, whatever the board decides to do, I see that as a primary. And then also I shared with the governor too, is that we had 19 agencies involved. And I know you know, I've been an EMT for 25 years so that's part of my blood. Um, so whatever we can do from the state to help reimburse for those costs. One of the things I share this, and this isn't political, but it is true, here in greater Minnesota, we run to put out a fire. And that's what we did. It was Sunday morning. Um, these 19, these people who came, I stayed back in Browns Valley to cover call because um, my partner came over here with the Beardsley crew, um, but I stayed back to cover ambulance call. And got somebody pissed me. Um, um, but if there's reimbursements that we can do, because Everybody dropped their things and came to help Clinton and to help um, Wheaton Dumont Elevator. And um, I put out a statement the next day, you know, saying that was what makes our area great. So those are just two things that I've been talking about that we can work with, help with the state if there's reimbursement for those those crews, and then what we can do to streamline the regulation process and also help with um, um, permitting. Because the longer we take, and I have heard the senator say this many times, the uh, higher the cost is. Yep. So that's that's what I have to share and, and so forth. And that's why we're here. We want to hear yep. from you guys. Um, what what can we do to help? What are you what are you already facing, uh, if anything? Um, uh, or what do you know are going to be some hurdles? And uh, I don't know if now's the right time or... or uh, no, perfect time. I think that this is great. We've got everybody kind of here. And yeah. And, um, you know, if there is, or if there is, and I know that, that you know, you're in the process, but, um, but just throw things out if, if there's something and, you should be thinking about. Or, and at some point, I'm, maybe, maybe who's got the story? I've heard parts of it, but I'm not sure I've heard it all about, do they know what started it? What kind of, what kind of caused it? And, uh, no, I'm, I'm interested in any no, of those. No, I mean, I, an elevator, so this is Philip Deal, uh, an elevator, um, Wooden elevator burns down. Everybody points to a bad bearing, right? That's, that's what everybody thinks about: is a, is a is a bearing fire or a bearing went out. But they don't know that. I mean, they they recovered all of the equipment that was in the basement, but 
it's all damaged by the fire it's all bent up by the excavators so I don't I don't think anyone is willing to stretch out and diagnose this with any certainty that they know what started it sure is the insurance company has all of that I'm assuming the equipment is still back here oh, on the okay. west hand side um, the insurance company dispatches a fire investigator but so they have it done right when now. when he left the building was still engulfed so it, it, oh. he'll look at that equipment but I don't think anybody will say with any certain certainty this is what started. where where did it generally start in, in we'll turn that over to Ron if you know uh, when I, I Ron show me the plant manager here yeah uh, when I arrived Sunday morning I, I went I went into the building to, to shut the power off and realizing that I had to exit as soon as possible I did take the time to open up the door that would look into the driveway and there were flames in the driveway that's not to say that they didn't work their way down sure but I will say that the, at, at the initial start of the fire there was at least fire in the driveway beyond that I, I just exited the building yeah. because it looked like it looked like a pretty uh, serious situation so I didn't want to hang around sure. it was a good plan yeah. So I know that doesn't come around specifically say it started down here, it started up there, but I will say that the driveway wasn't gone. Okay. How, how much corn or grain did, have you estimated you went went up in the fire? And uh, uh, yeah, I would say back to Philip here because yeah. the, all the records are digital, you know, and they're all stored <laughs> up in wheat. So I'd say fifty-five to sixty thousand bushels of wheat. Um, 12 to 15,000 bushels of corn and five or six loads of soybeans. Okay. So, okay. I mean, it sounds like a big number, right? Yeah. It's really not that big of a number. Our, our actual stock losses were pretty minimal considering most of the grain was already in steel bins and all of that was preserved. Are, are the, the bins that are here, are they still full or most are you getting empty for fall? They're not full. They're, there's maybe about another 100,000 bushels on site. Okay. But so th this bin here, the closest to the fire, was that full or empty? About three fourths full. I would say about three fourths full. And that had wheat. Yes. And then you were saying Tuesday, Phil, you were able to test it, and it seems like it's yeah. The in first good shape. the first tests failed for COFO, commercially objectionable foreign odor, so smoke. Yeah. Sure. The second tests passed, so I would think that with time. You know, it improves. The smoke goes away. Yeah. I mean, everything smells like smoke here, right? Well, yeah. 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 This is better today than Tuesday. Yeah. Tuesday. When I left here Tuesday, I you, you taste smoke and smell smoke for the whole day. It's amazing. The breeze helps us. And that's one of the things that they talked about. There is that day Sunday. Is there, there was no wind. You know, because if you're looking here, these folks here, they were pretty. And if you had a bad wind from the, the west um, and so forth, that would be, and, 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 and the two fire chiefs, I would be interested in how that all played out, what was, what happened, you know, the, some of the timelines, yeah. or maybe Donna, one of you guys could share the congresswoman and How, and how did Senator. you fight it? Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Well, I'll say that if uh, we would have had a wind out of the west or Northwest, it would have been very devastating to the town because there was little, as dry as it is right now, there was little grass fires out on the softball field. We put one out on the baseball field. Um, one of the neighbors over here, his cedar shakes on his roof of his garage started on fire. So if those embers would have been going that way instead of that way, it could have definitely been a lot worse. So when you got the page, what did you decide? Obviously, did you then obviously right away dispatch Orkinville, Gracefield? Yeah, so. I know you didn't do Beardsville right away, but I guess Gracefield and Orkinville are your mutual aid. Yeah. You did that right away. Yeah, so I was just getting home from my son's baseball tournament and got the page, and I turned around and left my yard, and I came around the corner and could see the smoke from my house. I live four miles away, so I immediately radioed dispatch and had them get Graysville and Ortonville coming right away to provide mutual aid. How many others ended up coming? 
what was it? Nine, 18 19. total, 19 with the ambulance, is that right? Or 19, 19 fire including, including Clinton. Okay. So one of the things that I heard too uh, is, is that quite a few farmers came to the campus to help out. Yeah. Because as, as you probably have heard, there's no small community that has the pumping power to pump that type of stuff. They were drawing water out of the, the, the lake and using the tankers to fill that community. The water walk, walk us through that a little bit, uh, fire chiefs. As How, far as I mean, just to kind of, those are the types of stories that are helpful when we start talking about infrastructure and well, you know preparing for future. Yeah, when when Ortonville got on scene, I'll let Chuck kind of explain what they did as far as getting water from Eli. I think we here. were the third department. I think Clinton was first, and Graceville came and set a pump up to start pumping out of the water tower out of the local supply okay. but you could see there wasn't going to be enough water so we set up on lake eli and ran holes from lake eli to here and started pump drafting out of lake eli to pump water to another pumper up here to start spraying water okay then that fed the that fed water going in the elevator until the next morning for over 24 hours how far is the lake well, it's 1,100 feet. I think so much holes we had. Okay. And then that shut down. That's what shut down Highway 75. Oh, I see. That, because we ran our holes over the top. There wasn't a culvert close enough. Yep. So we drug the holes through everyone's yard and over 75. Oh, interesting. To keep them so, water. So, so you were able to then pump enough out of the lake to keep keep the supply you needed? To keep for our trucks. For We had three trucks here. Okay. So we supplied water for our three trucks all day. And then Morris is ladder egg starting at like 8 o'clock. Once the tankers stopped when the fire got down low enough, then we switched our supply over to the, the ladder rig. And then they pumped water, Dawson pumped water from Lake Eli, uh, that ladder all night. So, so they had their own pumps going the same way as you? Yeah, the big, I think one of the, I mean, everyone was good here. One big help to us was when the state fire marshal came. Okay. Because they brought a lot of resources and getting mutual aid from farther out. Because we pretty much, ex we depleted all our resources. Yeah. Like we didn't have people or trucks. Yeah. And the state fire marshal was able to call people from an hour and a half away. Oh, really? And they came at night. I mean, they did all the overnights, those fire departments. That yeah. first overnight, people from an hour, from Dawson, Benson, Benson. They Cyrus. They covered overnight. And then the next morning, um, Kensington and Glenwood came to relieve well, we did cleanup efforts and stuff. And, and so the fire marshal helped get that. They organized all that. And, yeah. it, and that gave Drew a lot of a lot more time with the fire marshal doing that than worrying about trying to staff something yeah. for oh, yeah. 72 hours. Yeah. Right. So the right. To two fire marshals that came was a big help. So with the tankers from the surrounding communities and so forth, when they were putting the water in the tankers to bring it, which pumper was they were providing water for the tankers? They were going most, a lot of them were going to the Morris Ladder. Okay. And then the, our, your trucks. We had, our Clinton trucks. Yeah, we had Clinton trucks set up over by the school. Okay. And they were feeding drop tanks over there. Um, and then also the Morris Ladder and the Graceville Pumper over here on the corner. So how long did it take to contain once, once you realized the fire was happening and, and I imagine? Well, the hard part was trying to figure out what was the safe way to actually put it out. I mean, it's a 80 foot tall structure yeah. and there's really no safe way once it starts on fire to actually get it out completely. So it would have been, we would have been fighting it for, you know, a week. But so between Chuck and I, we pretty much made the decision to try to control it, let it flare up, control it, you know, and, and safely contain it and let it come down in a safe manner rather than all at once. Um, yeah. Or leaving a half standing structure yeah. for a demolition crew to try and come in. And that we can't get at. Uh, that wouldn't have been very safe either. Right. So what the, I suppose it was about six o'clock when it finally six or seven six thirty. Six it was after the fire marshal showed, showed up so it was probably six thirty and then it just kind of toppled on top of itself and then we were able to to contain it and okay. cool it down. Because was there a threat it was going to get into the other bins at some point, potentially, or how do you keep it from? 
Yeah, the, belt, this belt first up. this first tank going north here. I don't know how many gallons of water we sprayed on it, but that was the goal was to try to keep that cool as best we could for as long as we could. Two two ground monitors, one on each side of that tank the entire day until after well after that the elevator finally yep. collapsed. Okay. Um, so that bin had water on it the entire time we were here. The, uh, just on this side, the ground monitor from Ortonville on this side, we were pumping our truck from Eli as fast, as hard as we could. It was probably like 1,200 gallons a minute all day. Oh, really? It, it was the on, same, just on that bin. The same on the west side. We had the same ground monitor set up. Okay. Um, same gallonage all day. Goes to show how important the equipment is when you need it, isn't it? Yeah. Definitely. I think the the most important piece of equipment to, that people don't realize is it's easy for to get a town or people behind buying a new truck. It's not easy, but it'll happen. Yep. You can get a truck, they're flashy, they're shiny. You can get that kind of stuff. The hard part is getting radios. And I think a key part of this whole thing was having communications that 19 departments, all except for one department, I think, had the right radios that could all be patched to the Minnesota channel. And we could all talk to each other as soon as they pulled up. I think that's like the unsung hero of a lot of things, is those radios and the, and the system that the colony and the states put together. Is And I think moving forward, is that all those radios came around the 9-11 time. Yep. Yes, yeah. they did. They're all, they're all Motorola and they're all getting past their prime and there's no parts for them. I think the, the important part going that's forward is funding 800 megahertz, 800 megahertz yeah. is funding new radios for these apartments are $2,500 to $3,000 a piece. And most apartments have 15 to 20 of them, or should have, they don't. Okay. So it's a massive funding thing that the cities can, can't do. Like mm. you'll, you'll never do it. Yeah. Interesting, expand on that a little more. Why, why do you think it was so helpful? And I because think it, the answer's obvious, but I don't want to. What we, could, what we could do was Drew and the command people were on one channel. And it was able to move like the tankers and all that to another channel. And each, and each department could take a channel and still talk to their department, but one person could still talk to Drew whenever they wanted. Oh, so you have to be able to be able to talk to multiple people on multiple channels, depending on who you are. And, and, and the guys filling the tankers don't need to be into the conversation exactly. right here. But yeah. if, if they, need, they need to interact at some point, they, if, if something's going awry, they need to let them know, hey, got to shift our plan yeah and then it was when as, as more people came the more departments i'd say after like two o'clock or three o'clock and especially the next day that between emergency management and the sheriff they can set up channels that the whole state can get you can listen anywhere in the state yep. and those and those radios yep. so anyone the people coming from dawson and benson and all those we didn't have to give them radios they could just turn to that channel and we could talk to them even though they were way out of our area oh i see yeah and the, the one department that didn't happen I, it was more of a patching problem. I think they had them, but there was at the time we were still working on patching those departments through. Okay. So if we would have had more time, but they were only here for a couple hours. Okay. Yeah. So I think we could have got that, but I think that was. I mean, if you can't talk to people, like if something was unsafe on one side, they could tell people on the other side because you couldn't see it. Sure. Sure. Did so, most of the departments get up through the, I know that we did a lot of uh, grant money, a lot of, you know, so... so off the original. Those, so they are getting those. Yeah, and yeah, a lot of them good. came from that original grant back in the See, two, early... It. Yeah, in the early 2000s, we all got that grant, yeah. but now all those radios are shot. Sure <laughs> and that was a huge grant, because that was hundreds yeah. of thousands of dollars. Yeah. yeah. But it's like, it's going to have to happen again. Yeah. Because these small so, departments will never... So, so you mentioned the price of the Motorola. Some, some some issues I've heard from from competitors is that they kind of lock out the comp competition by just one chip or a different part. Uh, is is there maybe some room where we maybe need to open that up a little bit more and maybe the price comes down if it's not just one company? Yeah, yeah I, that I won't say, but it's, as long as the price come down and they're still the same quality, I don't yeah. think the departments would matter what yeah. what it is. We just we're just going to need them. But what, one of the issues is. I've heard you know, cons is that Motorola's kind of got a corner on the market, and the other, you know, there's other phone and radio manufacturers, and the, if, if they could get the key to the chip, it, it's, it's not a lot of it's, you know, or you can duplicate it. Yeah. 
yes. other, other brands. If, if you don't get one person. Then But then to also be able to um, have that first net, um, have that coverage for the cell phones out here, better coverage with cell phones, and then be able to use those cell phones in the way that we can use that radio someday out here. It's coming, but it's slow out here in western Minnesota, in the hump of Minnesota. Okay. Yep, so to work with ECN on that, that would be very helpful also. So, so to understand it, you're... You, you see the day where the cell phone could actually probably have their capabilities of the radio embedded in, in For it. some emergency responders, like ambulance mm -hmm. responder okay. types of groups, okay. maybe not the fire chiefs right at the scene. Right. That cell phone isn't going to, you can't hold that in your hand. Right. But it could help them get to the scene quicker. Okay. Yeah, yeah I mean, we're, we're doing some of that right now. I know Big Stone Graves, so, you know, we still have our pages, um, but it also comes across on the cell phone. The technology's there, but it's uh, it's it's not 100%. And mm -hmm. my phone doesn't always go off. That's why I carry my pager as a ambulance. So, and actually, I think Big Snow's a little better than the Traverse system is, but that's my opinion. Yeah, so it does vary for yeah. coverage out here. But it's still not at that point. But yeah, that would give a lot of flexibility. But to en ensure that ECN does um, does allow that grant funding for radios for our emergency responders, that's a, a very important. Topic that up. So and just out of curiosity, I know that it's probably an unfair question, but what would an estimate be for your department we, for it to get new? It, you would be looking at eighty thousand dollars, ninety thousand, yeah, and that's just I, that's just Ortonville. That's just Ortonville. I mean, that's not the county, so yeah. So it's, it's the small towns are. It's hard to come up with that, and as they go out, we you try to replace. It probably to be a minimum because at some point everybody's going to need six, eight, ten. Yeah. Yeah. Think, yeah. yeah. Like yeah, all the departments, if it all everyone's going to need them as they go bad. Yeah. But thanks, thanks for listening. Yeah. No, I. It's a very good point because um, you know you don't think of those. No, it's a little thing that no one but thinks of. That's thing, a huge it's expense. Well, it's, <clears throat> don't think of it. And, and that's why we're here. I mean. You guys did a great job. I mean, I, I would everything I've heard from people in the community and read. You know, it's, if it's a disaster, you, you want to be able to stop it, and run in, and, and, and put the fire out. Uh, so, so kudos to you. I mean, I think one like thing weather, to remember is these fire that? departments did all that with no power in town too. Right. Oh, really? So, is you shut that's the, that's one of the reasons that so many departments were called was. Right. An hour into the fighting the fire, all of a sudden we lost power in town that was completely unrelated to this event. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. And then, I, was, uh, I was wondering if it was. Yeah, Grace was up without power too. Yeah. Yeah. I think we too was too. We yeah, what's it happen? Something on. I'm not sure. The <laughs> Wapato was without power. Who's, who's the power here? Is it Otter Tail? Or? It is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, interesting. So, so you had a problem on top of a problem, or? Emergency on that's when we started calling a lot of departments. That's when we called Wheaton and Dumont and Herman, which are, I mean, Herman's what, 45 minutes away. Yeah. It's when that a happened, drive we were, for them. We were on the verge of exhausting our city water supply anyway, and that forced us to switch over to all pumped in water, hauled in water out of Eli and out of another local slough uh, with a dry hydrant that we had a truck set up pumping. And with, as the tankers would pull up, they would fill them and just to speed this process up to get them back to town quicker. Oh. Um, so from that point, from the time we lost power, from that point on, 100% uh, of our water came from sources other than the water tower. The significance of that is you don't, you can't keep replenishing your water tower when you don't have power. Right, yeah, the wells were down, the power was out, the wells were down and we were gonna, we knew we were gonna have to switch soon anyway. Um, shortly after the other, Departments got here and we got set up. I mean, we always hook to the hydrant right away, uh, get the truck going, get pumping to give us time to get other water sources established, drop tanks set up, um, and then got them switched over to non city water as fast as possible. Um, but we still had one truck pumping city water 
and, and until the power went out. And then that forces to switch everybody. Um, and that's, I don't know how many, do you remember how many tankers we had here? I have no, it was the main street between the, the tankers, the fire department tankers and the private people and the county and everyone else. Main street was full from like this road back to the highway, too deep with tankers waiting to dump. And so, I mean, I don't know how many there was, but it was uh, significant. 40 trucks all in water. That was kind of the staging area, and that goes back to the radios. I mean, uh, there's so not how room did the in this. private ones get involved. They yeah. just came. Start calling farmers, or they just they just came. They just, came. Really they just showed up. Just showed up. Yeah. And this area is too small to have all the congestion, so the staging area was down there. Yep. Uh, whichever department you know needed water next could let the the guy staging the tanker trucks know. He'd send the truck in, right. you know, one at a time, and uh, that worked very well. Um, and the. Other than Eli, the water that we were hauling in was pumped through dry hydrants, which were we acquired years ago through a DNR grant. Um, you know, without those, it'd be it'd take three times as long, four times as long to load those trucks. So, what is I, I, that's I'm not familiar with. Dry hydrant? Does that have a generator in your pump? It's just like a. It's a PVC pipe that is. Come, it's put in on the shoulder of the road or on the edge of the road right next to the, the water source. It goes down and out into the water so we can pull up with our truck and draft, suck water up and then typically we fill ourselves. Um, in this situation we had a, an extra pumper that showed up. Um, we knew it was going to speed the process up. Sent him out, he set up and as the trucks were coming he would just hook up, fill them and on their way. So that truck stayed out there um, and his sole purpose was to fill trucks. And I just want to say that sounds like you guys did far beyond what I could ever, I mean, what was expected. Thank you. I mean, it sounds like you ran an incredible operation to make sure that uh, this fire got put out and there wasn't any kind of uh, spreading from across the town. So it's amazing. It sounds like it was an incredible operation. Thank you. And, and remarkable, what a, what a testimony to rural Minnesota and, of course, Big Stone County, Clinton. I mean, having people just show up like that, that is that is common in rural Minnesota. And, uh, if you know, I could what? elaborate on that a little bit from the, from the board and management from Wheaton Dumont, you guys are awesome. It was yeah. unbelievable to watch that. So, to, to, watch, to watch that many fire departments and that many people work together all day long like you guys did, absolutely incredible so yeah. thank you for what you did that was that was amazing so yeah and again thank everybody for here for taking an interest in this it's a it's a loss it is and yep. uh, we've got to figure out what we're going to do next so yeah well and we want to be partners with you yep. so as, as it, things it, go it, forward and, and what there, what is the loss um the grain the main part of the elevator um some of the bins you can continue yeah, so the main Using. the main workhouse was lost. That was about fifty-five thousand bushels of storage capacity, and then the annex was lost. That was about one hundred and six thousand bushels of storage capacity. So, in terms of total storage capacity, it was not a big loss. The big loss is all the handling equipment is gone. We can't receive grain. We can't ship grain. We can't fill the bins. We can't empty the bins. So, effectively, right now. There's no elevator here. There's just a bin site with no way to fill it and empty it. Sure. And, and you're all truck here or do you have rail too? It's all truck here. All truck. No. My dad used to haul in and out of here, so he always liked to clip the elevator. <laughs> you loaded quick. <laughs> so are you going to have the ability to take um, enough at your other sites? I mean, for folks who would have dropped here? Yeah, I would say so. Okay. Uh, Graceville is about seven miles away. Uh, al other alternative would be Browns Valley. So we, we have reasonable alternatives. I mean, and the nobody else. And the oh yeah, the capacity okay. there, sure. Yeah. Okay. And I guess I could also say just the loss to the community, the people coming in, calling in that week. And oh yeah. Bring that's a huge loss. Yeah, definitely. Well, and for the farmers too, I mean, it's further to travel. 
if, if they're coming from the south, you got to go further. Right. Um, but but I think to your point, I mean, they got to stop and eat. They got to stop and fuel up. They, <laughs> lots of things that go on. Um, what 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 is something like this? And I, I I'm not asked. I don't I don't want to get into board questions or insurance totally. But I mean, do you generally have something like this covered by insurance? And oh yeah, we got good insurance, but yeah. it. it uh, it doesn't put it back the way it was, yeah. and yeah. the most expensive. And it doesn't thing, happen next week. Well, right. The most expensive yeah, thing to weeks. replace is handling equipment because yeah. your insurance generally covers your functionality. Well, unfortunately, the functionality here was was slow, and and that's about where it stops. So anything that we would do would require significant upgrades. You're not replacing like with like. You're replacing like with today's standards. So you probably have a magnitude of six to one costs, coverage versus what it would cost to replace it. Oh, really? Yeah. So and, that, and that deals, that's not necessarily the structure, it's the handling equipment. Well, I was on a, I was on a phone call yesterday to replace the head of a conveyor's 26 week wait. That's what, 26? 26 week wait. Oh, really? That's, and the cost, that's why we have the two bankers here, right? <laughs> <laughs> so so those are some of the decisions the board's going to have to wrestle with. Yeah. How I, do you? The reality is, is this, this place will have no functionality this fall. It's yeah. just, can, can, you, can you use the bins at all with temporary augers or anything or not? Well, Probably. they're too high. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can get a 130 foot auger, but by the time you put the angle on it, you won't be able to reach it. Sure. So it's a practical matter. Yeah. It's, it's, it's idle until you can get the right equipment in. <coughs> How many bushels in a year does the Clinton elevator run go through? A couple million. A couple million. Mostly corn or wheat and corn? How about half corn. What's that? About half corn, and then the balance is split between wheat and beans, about 500 each. Okay. And, and you said this first one's about three quarters full. Are the rest, what, and I maybe you mentioned it, but I didn't remember. Well, Are they all? Steel runs thunder. About three quarters full, empty, seven eighths full, and then pretty much empty beyond there. Okay. So, how do you empty them out now? That's easier than filling them, isn't it? There's truck spouts on them. We'll be able to get them about two thirds empty, and then the rest will have to be backed out. Okay. And, and this grain mostly goes where? Um, almost all of Clinton's wheat goes down to Ordonville and gets loaded on the TCW Railroad. Okay. For uh, St. Paul, Minneapolis, points beyond. Your corn goes to the cities? No. No. Nope. Uh, all the soybeans, virtually all of them, end up in China. Uh, okay. The corn, corn and soybeans get shipped to Graceville and then loaded on shuttles. And some corn stays domestically, but most of our corn gets exported. It does. Okay. And, and is that true with the whole wheat and Dumont co-op? Yeah, yep. I would say so. I mean, yeah. we, we sell we sell some corn to domestic markets. We sell some soybeans to domestic markets. Okay. They generally don't have the capacity we need. So, how much of them, um, roughly, on the corn you guys export in a year, roughly? Twenty-five million bushels. Twenty-five million. Congresswoman, did you hear that? Yes, I did. <laughs> That's a lot of exporting, isn't yep. it? Yeah, just just from, I mean, it's really a small area, a, 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 yeah. a region of western Minnesota. Probably about what? 12 million bushels of beans get exported. Yeah. How many how many uh, sites do you still have the Ashby elevator now? Yeah. yeah. Ashby's kind of the north. Isn't it about 13 sites you guys have? Yeah, that's about right. Ashby's the furthest northwest that we go, or northeast that we go. Yeah. Bridgeton would be the farthest west. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah. Britain, South Dakota, Rutland, North Dakota. Okay. Okay. 
Any, any corn to ethanol to speak of, or I, I noticed you didn't say that. So I, not a lot. Okay. You know, we certainly do some, but again, they got to be able to take real volume. So yeah. And and those plants probably purchase from from a 10, 15, 20 mile radius of them typically as well. Well, then they buy direct too. You know, yeah. they buy direct from the farms. Oh, sure. So, <laughs> sure. We need to sell a couple million bushels in a phone call. Yeah. Okay. So, what's left to uh, clean up? Uh, most of the grain and stuff. I can still smell the remnants, but uh, it smells like our beet troughs sometimes did on the farm. Well, behind you is a couple piles of ash and nails. Okay. Uh, I don't know when that's going to go out, probably this week yet. Uh, concrete demolition, we hope to start this week, but it looks like it'll be next week at the earliest. So they'll take all the concrete out and um, fill in the site and get it, get it cleaned up in that regard. There's, oh, there's very little steel left here. A uh, little bit of scrap to the north and some parts that the insurance company saved to the far north. Is that grain pile in the far north gone? They're working on that right now, okay. I believe. Okay. And, and so, pretty much the foundation is kind of there that the cement they're talking about. When do you anticipate plans, uh, rebuilding what you would need at Jeff's point? permits, regulatory stuff that you aware of yet or I would think what I what? would think permitting and regulatory issues would be kind of under control uh, yeah. but and it's gonna take it's gonna take a month of arm wrestling with insurance just to figure out where we are on step one right okay uh, again there's there's probably a, a six to one difference. Maybe maybe I'm even light on that as compared to what conveyor and leg that we had here as to yeah. what it would cost to replace it now. So. How old was the one that then? How old was the infrastructure there? There were two separate structures. The main house was originally built in 1948. Okay. And then the, the adjacent annex right next, just, they were just a few feet apart. Uh, the the annex was built, and I, I can't nail it down, but somewhere between the late 1960 and 62. Okay. So there's your answer as far as the difference. Yeah. So the, how many staff people was here, and you know, obviously this is an idle site. What's the plans with the staff? Um, they're going to other facilities, or well, some of the staff drove truck, so they're okay. they're pretty mobile. I mean, okay. they could they could dispatch from their home if necessary, but I guess you would say two permanently assigned staff members were here. I mean, it, one one didn't work here every day, worked at other locations. How long has Wheaton Dumont owned? What? January 1st, 2016, I think. 2016. Okay. Four years. I was visiting with Ron the other day, and I think you said you've been here for 41 years. Is that what you said? Since the fall of 78. 41 years. Wow. That's a long time. It's got tree rings like, on it. Yeah. Started young. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it started young. Yeah. It doesn't feel like it is. <laughs> so, so if, if you look at silver linings, what, what, what would be building back uh, better? Why? What would what would come? Yeah, here's come a silver a back line. I mean, this is uh, kind of crazy to think this way, but if you want to call it bad, if you want to call old bad, everything old and bad is gone. It burnt down and is gone. It was slow and it was small. Okay. If you want to call that a silver lining, I guess you could. That the, probably be the, faster. The majority of the storage capacity is still here, and it's modern. But part of it, you know, the unload speeds were slow, even though that it was modern. Um, 
the, the bad part of that is again, it goes back to all the functionality was inside the, those buildings that were lost. And uh, Clinton was known as a, as a wheat handling site, handled a lot of wheat for wheat in Dumont. Had a number of bins that are gone now. Um, I don't know, 40 bins maybe. Between the two, yeah, yeah. 24 bins in the, in the main house and 18 in the, in the, in the wooden oh. annex of a variety of sizes. That, okay. made it, that it made it real flexible for doing what we brought to the table was the ability to, uh, to, to create premium quality wheat. So I meant able to mix. Right. As okay. needed. And, and you need to separate to be able to do some of that. Right. Okay. As so, Philip was saying, our functional, functionality has kind of been taken away. That's where the costs really skyrocket. When you talk about replacing that functionality, you're probably talking 25 to 1 now, not 6 to 1. Oh, really? Yeah. And over the years, part of that was because things got bigger and the smaller stuff you could put to good use by... The market, by. The market still likes to be, buy wheat small. Okay. The market does not like to buy corn small or soybean small, but the market still trades wheat in small increments. The flour mills actually got a lot smaller. Really? Yeah. yeah. So, so by comparison, what you, you kind of mentioned two million bushels in a sale, I'm assuming you were talking corn. What would a wheat sale range Well, a, from? Cor a corn shuttle is 450,000 bushels, a soybean shuttle is 425,000 bushels. Ron and his staff were loading 25 car trains a week in Ortonville. So, say 85,000 85, bushels. Okay. And that's in what type of time range? Well, the Twin City and Western has always been pretty generous with their, the time that they allow. Uh, for our facility in Orthville, it might take three days. Okay. Three, three regular work days. Yep, yep. That 25 car train, once it got to a yard in St. Paul, that might get broken up five, six different ways. So might, two might go here, five might go there, but it, but it leaves here in a group of 25. So, so a broker or somebody's buying it as a group, a, a, buy, a purchase group yeah. in the cities, but it might go to five, six different buildings. Right, yeah. yeah. Hmm. You, you mentioned fires on, on Cedar Shake roofs. What, what type of damage was there that came out of it? Is it, there it, some? It was caught pretty quick, so I mean it was no significant damage, really. Okay. A claim, to my knowledge, hasn't been submitted by the owner. In fact, his comment was that whatever he had in the building, if that would have been out of there, he'd let the building go. <laughs> Silver lining. So that, that's that's so a high value of the building. Yeah. yeah. Drew, don't that say that. That was a comment that he got from me. And he said if he hadn't had stuff in there that he valued, he'd let the building go. Yeah. It would have been fine. Okay. And that is that, that is definitely a silver lining that the rest of the community didn't suffer the, the devastation that we saw here. We never want devastation, but it is better than when it's in one area instead of the whole community. And I, I'd say it's the fast action of everyone oh, yeah. here and in the city. Yeah. Um, and the responders here. The sheriff was here, the police, or the fire chief was here, and all of the other people. Um, and emergency alerts was sent out to evacuate a three block area around this elevator. Um, they did that quickly, so the quick response by everyone, it saved a lot. It really did, it really saved a lot. How or who first noticed it? I, I guess I can feel that. I, I was, on Sunday morning around 10 o'clock, I was getting ready to come up here, to come to work. And I received a phone call with a, from a, a gentleman, a friend, our, our local baseball team to the northwest of our bin site here over on the baseball field to take a hitting, hitting practice in preparation for a game they were to have later that day. And I received a call from one of the guys. He, he indicated that it didn't look right. With deep, they thought it was dust coming out the top of the elevator, but that wasn't the case at all. Oh, really? No, it was small. Oh. But he alerted you. Yeah. You came up here and yeah. that's what you... But and he, he called 911. He actually called 911. Yeah. I, I asked him to. I said, Chris, just call it in. 
I said, it, it, it certainly isn't dust. Uh, nobody had been in. I, I was the last one to leave on Saturday afternoon at, at uh, 2 o'clock. And, uh, of course, everything was fine then. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, uh, so, he, he called me about somewhere in the neighborhood 10 30 to 10 or, yeah 10 15 to 10 30 okay. and by the time i got up here he was over here this building to, to the east is a uh, shop owned by a local trucking firm and he jumped in their tr a truck that was sitting here and pulled it away oh really yeah so it was not even his own no <laughs> it was Chris another testimony of small towns yeah, yeah. Well, I will. I will just say thank you to everybody yes. for coming out and uh, talking to us today. I think we're we're making another stop, so I don't want to keep that. we're just waiting, waiting. Uh, but thank you again. And I know that uh, Ben Anderson, district director for my office, he's got cards, and so I think it's very, very important to stay in touch. And uh, so you can keep handing those out. Please reach out. I, I know it's it's not going to be the quickest process to. You know, as you're talking about months and things like that, but please keep us in the loop and anything we can do. And both Tori and Jeff will, you know, want to be in the loop too and make sure do you guys have a special session coming up? We do, and, and Tuesday the governor confirmed it again. Yeah, so there you go. So, um, you know, we, we do want to do what we can to help, so please keep, keep us informed on it. I'd like to reiterate thanking all the local fire departments. But we have to emphasize, these are volunteers. Yep. And, I mean, whatever we can do, if they need uniforms, it just proves how important and how expensive it is for the small community. So, yes. whatever we can do, or you folks can do, it would be greatly appreciated, because I know they can't do this on You are absolutely right. They are. And they're a vital part. Obviously and, a vital part of it. And that's one of the, yeah, and that's one of the things we expressed to the governor, because there is funds for that. There is a a state fund for stuff like that for replacements and we are looking into that yes absolutely absolutely as a fire department we prioritize our needs every year and one that constantly gets pushed back we need equipment we need equipment obviously safety is important as well but the average age of the turnout gear that all of our local clinton department guys were wearing is 20 plus years old that stuff uh, we're supposed to be replaced after 10. I'm wearing my high school English teachers and he's been retired for 15 years at least, yeah. Okay, so. <laughs> I'd echo uh, Congresswoman Fishbach's uh, remarks. Thank you guys for yes, your great you. response. Uh, uh, fire departments and uh, board members, uh, emergency managers, mayor, uh, city. I, I, I realize it becomes everybody's uh, everybody's uh, objective to take care of it. And, uh, you, you've reiterated that. Uh, when you've got farmers, uh, private people coming with their product, uh, their uh, water haulers just to help out uh, you know not knowing if you need it or not that that's that's amazing and uh, that's the kind of spirit we want to keep keep alive and uh, be ready for because these unforeseen unfortunate circumstances happen and that's part of what got to be ready for it sounds like you guys did a great job so.